I don't deny that there is an element of ideological battle going on there, and it can be really hard to pinpoint what the truth is. Okay, this might sound really counterintuitive, but whenever I research and write about China, what intrigued me the most has always been opposing views. Because as a Chinese person, I do wonder why someone decided to pick on China. And honestly, if someone gives me an objection that's coming from an authentic, sincere and vulnerable place without weaponizing their words, I would be so willing to integrate my blind spots. Because if you follow China for long enough, you know that there is a little bit of an ego dance between one side and the other when people want to hit each other with an argument and to prove something. Satellites I am are not kind of a, I am weird, not. but tell me. Yeah, uh, forgive me, you are not what? It does feel really good for my ego when I hear from a creator who has made a really strong case for China to either debunk or expose an argument. You know, you get that sensation where you are being emotionally validated. But slowly, I noticed that these creators, you know, with the best intentions and out of pure love for China, often speak from this passive aggressive, angry and defensive place. And that is such a shame because their point would have gone a lot more further if there is some space for polarity. I never think that the goal is to make everyone likes China and agree with everything it does but rather we try to understand someone else's experiences and grievances so that we can see the world from their point of view. When we are communicating with them, we can use our world in a more palatable way so that there is some room to navigate the differences. What if the goal is empathy? That's why in today's video, I want to make sense of a few scenarios where someone takes on a critical lens on China. By understanding who they are, what they went through and why they hold the views that they do, I want to share with you my discovery of some of the nuances when it comes to the China critic and why China is so much more than the good and the bad. To start this conversation, I want to first address the fundamental question of why Chinese people love China. Let me tell you a story of my mother who grew up in the 70s before China went through modernization in any real sense. When she was still at school, there was no transportation or whatsoever. So she had to get up really early at 5 a.m. and commute for two hours in the mud to go to school. For her, with six siblings and very little income, she had to spend all her free time working in the field and selling anything that she and her sister found valuable. My grandparents didn't take care of her well, so she really just had to make it on her own. My mother was so chronically hungry that she basically failed her university entrance exam because she couldn't master the energy to focus. When my mother became an adult, that was in the early 90s, she moved to wealthier cities like Shenzhen and started working with clients that had benefited from the booming economy. In a few years time, she built up the business skills and saw opportunities and became an entrepreneur herself. So whenever my mom reflected her life with me, the story that she told me over and over again, which it's kind of repetitive to me. Um, it's how lucky she felt to have the opportunity to change the trajectory of her life and how lucky and happy she is to have witnessed the development of China over decades as opposed to the deprivation she had to suffer as a child. People are emotionally invested in China because they have experienced firsthand its transformation from rags to riches. You can kind of apply this story archetype to how most older generations view about China and what they pass down to their children. Of course, that's not the story of everyone. And certainly there are people who live in China as an outsider has been alienated from this narrative. Let's say you grew up in an English speaking Western countries where basic necessities were never a problem. The cultural values that you were imprinted with were about higher levels of human needs like free choice and individualism. You didn't know a lot about China or its language other than the things that you've heard on the news. Now you want to have fun, explore the world and have more life experiences. And China happens to welcome English teachers and is willing to pay a good sum of money for it. So you took the opportunity and moved to China.
Initially, you were amazed by the delicious food, friendly people, mysterious architecture, and being at the center of attention. But as time went by, the honeymoon period passed, and you started to become more immersed in its society. You noticed things that you weren't very used to. Sometimes you have to give away your personal ID to access public services like museums and library. CCTVs are everywhere, and your cultural upbringing tells you to see its intention differently. Sometimes people stare at you in a strange way because they've never seen a foreigner before. Other times you might even have unpleasant interactions with the police or deal with bureaucracies that locals never have to. A while ago, I had this really interesting conversation with a British lady that I met randomly on the street. And she shared with me her experiences in China as a foreigner. She isn't a China critic, but it helps to share some light on different views. It's too much when, for example, when I'm walking down the road and I'm just minding my own business, I might just be going shopping, and people just stop and stare, like I've got two heads. I think if you don't have Chinese friends, you're stuck, yes. basically. Yeah. My Chinese friends have been, a, have been like a pillar to me during COVID and have really helped me to get really through it. Really nice people. Nice Chinese people overtake the negative moments that I've had here for sure, definitely. That's why I stuck it out for so long, otherwise I'd have gone, I'd have flown out of here ages ago. Exactly. Yeah. Depending on how much you resonate with the Chinese culture, your take on China could really go either way. And it can be really hard for a foreigner to adapt or assimilate, especially if they don't speak the language fluently or don't particularly relate to its customs. All of these things can really make a big difference in how a person feels about the country, for better or for worse. If you lived or traveled to China before, let me know in the comments how your experience shaped the way you look at the country. There is another type of China critic that I found to be equally intriguing. In the media, there's a term called the left behind, which is mainly used to describe the white working class in countries like the US and the UK. At its core, Anderson, what drives the politics of the white working class is economic anxiety and feeling left out. These people don't have any direct experiences with China, but they have grievances when it comes to the structural change of the global economy under China's rise. I was unemployed for a year, trying to find a job. Now, luckily, I found a decent job around here, $13 an hour, but still it took me over a year to get this job. Here's the story. During the Great Depression, when American President Roosevelt promoted his New Deal to increase social welfare, he used a term, the forgotten man, to show that he hadn't forgotten the working class who needed the state support to get back on their feet. That was nearly a century ago. In today's world, the forgotten men were truly forgotten. The hardworking blue collars who depended on the traditional industries like cotton textiles and electronics for their comfortable middle-class lifestyle. The numbers of factories in places like Kentucky, Ohio, and Tennessee has declined drastically because the expenses were cheaper in Asia. Imagine being laid off from a stable job and having no better choice but to be an at-will worker earning $11 per hour. Your wife, who was making $8 an hour at a cleaning company, decided to leave you. People you know began to suffer from depression, alcoholism, and drug addiction. Nowadays, only people with college degrees seems to be getting richer, and people like you are doing worse than your grandfathers. Negative views of China has declined about 20 percentage points after Trump took office. Trade deficit, bad. China, bad. You can't let China rape our country. We can't continue to allow China to rape our country. Trump promised to these people that he was going to take back their jobs, forging alliances against China. But it doesn't really matter if Trump has taken advantage of people's innocence and struggles to gain electoral or partisan support. But the point is, at least some neglected voices were being heard, soothed, and validated. Can you really blame people for resenting China? Is it really about China? If you're still watching at this point, you are probably just as nerdy as I am. <laughs> I recently came across a few books written by authors with more extensive experiences working with the Chinese as well as the West. And there is an argument that pops up a few times, which is that the way China operate business in its domestic market has alienated the big constituencies in America, which is the American business communities. In the past, companies like Boeing, General Motors, and Ford 
played a big role at lobbying the U.S. government to maintain a more non-confrontational relationship with Beijing because they believed that was essential for them to do business inside China. But after Trump launched the trade war, none of these groups stepped up advocating in favor of China. The complaint is that China favored domestic companies over foreign companies and there is this pressure to transfer technology for these foreign companies to continue to access the Chinese market. The American Chambers of Commerce in Shanghai's 2018 China's Business Report said, Survey takers believe Chinese government policies favor local companies, that is 54.5%. 60% reported that China's regulatory environment lacks transparency. China denied the aspect of forced technology transfer, saying that it was never its intention. China actually spent trillions investing in research and investment and purchasing licenses every year. So from a Chinese standpoint, sharing technology is only a natural process in a joint venture. But still, the concern is that given China's Made in China 2025 strategy, there is this incentive for local companies to localize these technologies, repackage it in a Chinese version and sell it at a lower price. So it squeeze off the profit made by these foreign companies. Even though an American firm can benefit financially from transferring technology in China, it still adds stress to other American firms back at home. If you think about it, this is not the best scenario for US tax status, especially when it comes to cutting edge stuff like aerospace or chemical industries. This dynamic can look like a puzzle piece in the US-China rivalry, where the US still wants to do business with China, yet worries that China is going to outcompete it one day. Maybe there's a bit of a jealousy going on. I don't know. <laughs> Not as bad as you think, right? People might disagree or don't like China because they generally don't relate to the culture, had bad experiences, to which I can only say, I understand, sorry to see you go. Other people have problems because their financial welfare is directly or indirectly impacted by the rise of China. This is only a part of human affairs, not a problem. This video only covered the tips of an iceberg and whatever that you read about China, either on the Western media or the Chinese media, I don't deny that there is an element of ideological battle going on there and it can be really hard to pinpoint what the truth is. But if you can walk away from this video having some clarity on how different cultural experiences might have shaped someone's opinions or discourse on China, then it does its job. If you have lived in China, traveled to China or have any sort of indirect experiences with China, let me know in the comments how that shaped the way you look at the country. If you enjoyed this video, these are two others I made on China, so go have a watch. Otherwise, thank you so much for spending the time with me. I appreciate you and I will see you in the next one.